Forum G2. Geopolityka i gospodarka. Więcej informacji na www.forumg2.com Excellent. It's a new surprise, so I was prepared to give a speech in Polish, but uh, yeah, let's let's try to do it in English. We have the pr previous presentation was in English, so we had Prezes Wrochna who who was talking about the economy of space, and we had one of the the great examples just just after one of the most commercial examples you can uh, you can imagine having a bit cli client database and providing internet internet access to the whole planet so my presentation will be a bit different i'd like to show a bit what inspires me in space and why the human space flight is a big inspiration so we will be talking about the economy of space quite a lot then later on during the panel but what drives me this is this inspiration part and i think the human potential of um, uh, in in spaceflight is limitless. So let me try to inspire some of you with a couple of slides. I wanted to tell three main stories, but we cannot talk about the human spaceflight uh, space flight without the Apollo program. So. The Apollo, this is one of the photos I have chosen. All of you know this, the, the pictures of first people on the, on the moon, Neil Armstrong and Buzz, Buzz Aldrin. I really like this photo, though, and this, I think, gives a different perspective So on the human spaceflight. One thing, on this photo, we can talk about the Earth rise. We are always used to talking about the sunrise or sunset or moonrise eventually. This is the earth rise above the surface of the sun. What inspires me about this photo as well, this is the Apollo 11 mission. So in the Eagle lander that you know here, there is Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, but few people remember about, um, about Michael Collins who stayed in orbit of the moon, waiting for his colleagues to go on the surface of the moon and then back. So. This photo for me is very inspirational because, as you can see, all of us, all of the humanity is on Earth. The other two people and other two astronauts are in the Eagle Lander. Actually, the only human being who ever existed is, is the, and it's not on this photo, and he's not on this photo, is the author of the photo, is, is Michael Collins. I think giving human spaceflight gives you this perspective. Actually, I could even say more. That whole life in the universe is captured on this photo except of the author who looks at it. So I think the human spaceflight gives this perspective. That's why this is one of the first stories I wanted to share with you. Let me jump a couple of years later. So that was in the 60s. We know we landed on, on the moon in the 60s. Let me jump to 1984. 1984, this is the year I was born. So uh, maybe this photo connects with me quite a lot, as well as I think it's extremely fascinating to see this small astronaut floating in this vastness of the, of the universe on low Earth orbit. This is the space shuttle mission, the STS-41B, on which uh, Bruce McCandles was the first astronaut floating untethered, unattached to his spacecraft. Or, or the space station. So he just uses a jetpack and his EVA suit. So he is in a suit that maintains his, his bodily functions, provides oxygen and, and, and so on. He has what was called MMU, uh, meant maneuvering unit. So the jetpack that allows to orient himself and go closer and further from his space shuttle. That was the space shuttle Challenger, by the way, that in 84, th there were three spacewalks like this. Um, then it was stopped. As far as I know, the MMU units are still available on the International Space Station as the emergency for certain emergency procedures. On the other hand, such, uh, as, um, such spacewalks are not performed anymore. So these were three, only three spacewalks like this that happened. I think this photo is scary but it's extremely inspiring. So knowing that we can master the volume around us, the, the space around us on low, low Earth orbit, having just this minimum technology, I think for me is fascinating. 
So that's the second story. Let me tell you the third one. Let's move roughly 10 years later. That's the photo from the repair of the Space Hubble telescope. The Space Hubble telescope is, is this amazing platform on our orbit that was launched in the 90s and provided amazing science for the past 30 years. So the best pictures of the universe and providing in the last 30 years, we discovered many, many exoplanets. The, the astronomy uh, and astrophysics boomed as a, as a science, and mostly thanks to, to the um, uh, Hubble telescope. Here on the photo, you can see below there is a space shuttle Endeavour, if I'm not mistaken. This is Endeavour STS-61 in 93. I really like this photo. You can see a space shuttle docked to the Hubble Space Telescope, and the works are being done by one of the, of the astronauts. So, um, I like this mission because basically we had a European accent on this mission. Actually, um, one of the Swiss astronauts, Claude Nicolier, that I met at the, at the EPFL in Lausanne, and we had, a, we had a lecture together, he was actually in the space shuttle and doing these works as well in space. So, I have a personal connection to this photo. Um, what I really like as well is this is the furthest mission, manned, crewed mission, that happened since the Apollo program. Since we finished the Apollo program, program in the 70s, the furthest we went, it's, it is the repair of the Hubble telescope. So roughly 600, 700 kilometers. Um, yeah, you, at the bottom you can see the cargo of the space shuttle. You can see one of the wings of the Endeavour space shuttle, as well as another arm sticking out from the space shuttle to which an astronaut is attached and going and get, being, getting ready to work on the Space Hubble telescope. Also, the, these works, as the Space Hubble was repaired in the optic system, the telescope has never been designed to be serviced in that way. So, what what, what inspires me is we can still do these works. Even though on Earth we designed the whole uh, telescope, we put it in orbit, it did not perform and it needed a specific works, we can still go there and we can perform such complex works in outer space. So our flexibility, adaptability of human beings for a space, uh, human space flight is, is immense especially compared to automatic systems. We know we explore the, the Mars with, with rovers. On the other hand, we know how we are adaptable as human beings to perform works that have never been thought possible before. Now let's... These are stories from the past, but what is now? What, what is the future of the human spaceflight? What, how we can contribute? So I'll show you two photos. Everyone knows the Artemis program. So, a small brother program or sister program of, of, of the Apollo program. We are coming back to the moon. We know about this. This is the, Artemis, the whole Artemis program. Here on the photo we can see this is a photo from the European Space Agency. We don't see the Orion capsule that will take astronauts to the moon eventually with the Artemis 3 mission. This is uh, the photo from the Artemis 1. So we know we launched in November last year. Um, we went around the moon, that was an uncrewed mission, testing our technological solutions to bring people back. So, our uh, Orion capsule is at the bottom of this, um, of this photo, and not really visible, but what we can see, this is the European service module, the ESM. This is what we designed in Europe. The European ser service module provides life support systems for astronauts. It provides propulsion, generation of power, so we designed these systems, and thanks to our collaboration with NASA and the European Space Agency and other agencies as Canadian or JAXA, we basically built these massive international programs, and we know we are aiming to go to the moon. Um, Artemis II will be a crewed mission. Astronauts will go around the moon, a bit like, like, like Apollo 8, where astronauts went around the moon and splashed down back to the ocean without landing. So this should happen in uh, uh, 20, 2024. Uh, then the, Apollo, uh, the Artemis 3 mission will be with, with the landing on the moon. So we know this will be an American landing, and potentially, I think, in September 2026, maybe this timeline will change. 
But when we go back to the moon, this is a render of what can happen. In, uh, we know that the landing system on the moon, Starship, was selected by NASA. If I'm not mistaken, there might be an announcement tomorrow about a second potential redundant landing system that might be selected by NASA. But the European Space Agency works on a, on a lander as well. That is called Argonaut. So, as you can see, this is a pressurized vehicle where astronauts can go and land on the moon and will perform certain works using Argonaut. So it is a lunar lander, a bit like Eagle was for the Apollo program, or eventually Starship. It's a, it's a different technological solution to land on the moon, much bigger, but as well providing this capability for us to touch down on the surface. So, yeah, but what is our part? I, I don't know what, I cannot show you any pictures for me being in a rocket or me being in space. I hope I'll be able to, to, to show you such pic pictures in the future. Who knows? On the other hand, what will happen with us as our career astronaut crew? So five people from Spain, um, Switzerland, the UK, France and Belgium, they are training actively for the mission. We are 11 people in the reserve, in the reserve corps. So we are waiting for our training. Anyhow, our whole group is going to build experience on the International Space Station. So our first destination is to go to the International Space Station that circles around the Earth at 400 kilometers of the altitude, and this will be our first experience for those who will go. We know that the Artemis program is open. This probably will be dedicated to the previous selection, but who knows? The space programs have this tendency to get sometimes postponed for different reasons. So it might be that also our selection will be uh, a part of the Artemis program and the landing. Maybe from our selection there will be a first man or woman, a European, touching down on the moon. So also with the Artemis 3, this is the American landing, but Artemis 4, four 5 and 6, there is a space for a European astronaut. So potentially multiple pe people can, will go and will touch down and walk on the moon. And I don't think this is excluded that one of them will be a pole. So thank you so much for your attention and I hope you have questions. I remember, which is the uh, early 90s, uh, I always remember that uh, many people say that our next step in the exploring of the space should be the man on the surface of Mars. So I would like to ask you, what is, in your view, the perspective of landing on Mars and whether there's a chance that, that the first man on Mars will be the European man? Oh. Good question. I don't know. It's going so much into the future and the European on Mars. I think we've been, as the humanity, we've been looking towards Mars as the next natural step for, for a long time. We were on the moon, and moon for us, it's a natural step again to build the space program and build technologies to, to be able to go further. This is this platform that allows us to test technologies. When it can happen to go to Mars, I don't know. Maybe in the next decade or maybe in two decades. I think technologically it's possible. We know we are exploring Mars from the with using automatic systems, Mars rovers. We have, uh, we have multiple, at ESA and NASA, there is multiple exploration program, programs for Mars. I think people will go to Mars. I think it will be a very, very ambitious program. It's far and it's long to go. So a one-way trip is six to eight months. The comeback trip needs to happen after a certain time when the alignment of both planets is, is, is correct. Um, who will go in terms of nationality, I cannot really say. It can be American or maybe Chinese or maybe someone from Europe. So only the future will tell. I think there are three main challenges. I don't think technology is such a big problem as of today to be able to go. Most of three main challenges I perceive as challenges for humans. One is how to do the operation in space, the space medicine, and really treating emergency if you need to operate on someone. The trip, six months, let's say, six months one way, six months the second way, maybe a year there, maybe two years mission, anything can happen. So this has to be treated. The second main challenge, what I would perceive, maybe that, that with the highest potential, highest impact, is psychological problems. 
So it's, an, it's the isolation, it's a group dynamics with a point of no real return. Maybe you can use the Mars gravity to come back right away without the landing, yes, but you cannot really easily stop and do a U-turn midway. So this is psychologically very, very difficult. And the second problem is the exposure to radiation of humans, that as of today, we cannot really certify and go towards months as human beings because of the, uh, of the doses that we take. So this is a technological problem. This is my specialty, actually. I work with radiation, mostly what is the impact of radiation on electronics and systems. On the other hand, this is one of the big challenges, how to handle that. And we know we do not want to take a very, very big mass to shield, shield us from, from radiation. So yeah, I would say these are three main challenges. I hope I answered this, the question quite in a detailed way, but feel free to follow up. <laughs> sure. For example, um, the, the latest videos published a couple of years ago by the American Army with extraterrestrial like UFOs uh, made by pilots. Mm -hmm. What is your opinion on that? And do your colleagues have any experiences? So difficult to say. I didn't do basically the statistics among the whole group of astronauts. I know just a couple of them, so <laughs> so this is uh, one one part of the answer. Um, I think all astronauts believe there is an extraterrestrial life because basically when we go to the ISS, we are outside of our atmosphere. We are in space. We are the extraterrestrial life at this particular moment, being on ISS. So I would stick to that on my science perspective. I don't know what is out there. Uh, <laughs> But uh, I'm very open to experience this and maybe explore further. Okay, thank you. And next question. Uh, what do you think about perspective of cooperation uh, with China on the moon? Uh, in technical problems and in uh, political problems, thanks. Uh, about collabor collaborating with China as of today in terms of technology and, uh, and human space program, you mean, to go towards the moon? Yeah. So, to be, to be honest, I don't know so much about the Chinese space program. I know that the Chinese space program is very well advanced. They built the space program ground up from the 90s. So, they didn't have too much technology, but they also did not enter a big collaboration, uh, global collaboration, to build their space program. As of today, I think in 2021, they, the, the Chinese uh, space agency scored this, let's say, hat trick in space. They landed on Mars, they have a space station, they have a capability to send humans to orbit, and they landed with their experiment on the dark side of the moon. So actually, their space program is very, very well advanced. Um, I don't know how, how it is going to, to play in the future. It's not up to me to really comment on politics of that. I think this may be um, a, a natural competition between, um, let's say, NASA, ESA with JAXA and Canadian Space Agency and potentially a Chinese space agency pushes forward funding and brings the technology much more mature and trying to basically will win this race, like we had in the 60s and 70s. So in terms of technology development, is a, it's a very, very progressive and very, very, very big boost for the space sector. Uh, I wouldn't like to comment on politics because like, I don't, it's not my field of expertise here. Um, so far, we've really been looking at space travel to learn things, science, exploration. Do you see a big application in terms of mining and natural resources or beyond that in settlement? This is a great question and a big field of research. What I see a bit more short to mid-term is rather the in-situ resource utilization when we go somewhere. Let's say we go to the moon and we would like to have our presence to be constant and continuous on the moon and sustainable, we will have to use resources locally. We cannot bring them. So actually this in situ resource utilization, it will be a big, uh, big field of research and technology development, how to build a habitat from what is available, how to potentially 
go to Mars, and we know with SpaceX and the Raptor engine that is methane-based is because basically you can synthesize fuel and an oxidizer on Mars to be able to come back, so you don't need to take all this mass. So this is one big field, as you, as you mentioned. I think this, this is a short to mid-term. Long-term, really um, uh, using resources and bringing them back, it seems like a bigger challenge, because obviously you need to have all this mass of fuel to be able to go somewhere, extract and bring back. I don't think this is excluded, but maybe as of today, I would say might be a bit early to say. We know that a lot of people are looking into helium-3 on the moon to be able to mine it and come back and eventually have a quite a long-term um, energy generation for the planet of Earth. So this will be definitely looked into. For me, it's very difficult to say as of today where it will finish. It would be quite a natural possibility. Uh, I've I read about um, research programs to be able to capture asteroids on the deep retrograde orbit of the moon and mine them for tens or hundreds of years before releasing them from, from the orbit. So these are a very long-term research projects that could be possible in the, in the future.